County Historical Society and we are here at Heritage Village today for speaking of history the funding for this program has been supported or provided by the Florida Humanities and sponsored in part by the State of Florida Department of State Division of Arts and Cultural and the Florida Council of the Arts and Culture Art Levy the gentleman to my left the tall guy he is the one that's going to be speaking today Art has been here in the area for quite a while. He works for the Florida State, or excuse me, Florida Trend. And Florida Trend, he is an associate editor. That is a business magazine throughout the state of Florida if you haven't found it. And during that time, he gets a lot of stories. And the stories that he will um, end up, or oh, was it the 100 and? So far, 130. 130 of them. The book actually contains many of them, and that's what you're going to hear about today. He's a 1984 graduate of the University of Florida, and we were talking earlier, it's not a good year for the Gators, but go Gators. His first book, Made in Florida, it's artists, celebrities, activists, educators, and other icon, icons from the Sunshine State. All of this will be, um, I guess, what he'll be talking about now. And his next book is going to be about going through the state and seeing all the public gardens throughout the state of Florida with his family during the pandemic. So look forward to that. Now, Art Levy, um, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks all of you for being here too. This is a real honor for, for me. That's my wife Sharon back there. Uh, my oldest son is 22. My youngest son's 19. And starting when they were like three and four, we would come here. We live in St. Pete. We would come here and enjoy Heritage Village, go to walk over to the Botanical Gardens too. And so it's just wonderful to be, I'm sorry my kids aren't here for this. Um, it's true, I, I, I graduated from UF in 1984 and have worked, let me advance this. Um, I've been working in journalism Newspapers are now a magazine ever since. Um, I started out as a, as a news writer, uh, a newspaper covering beats like crime and education and government, and eventually began to write uh, feature, feature stories and profiles, and that what eventually led me to Florida Trend. And uh, since 2007, I've been tra traveling the state, uh, interviewing icon iconic Floridians, we call them, but they're essentially just prominent people um, who are really good at their jobs or have accomplished something notable. And so that's, that's what populates this book, um, Made in Florida. And uh, some of the people that I've interviewed, uh, really the, the long title indicates um, the many kinds of people I've talked to, the, you know, uh, I've talked to very from Burt Reynolds to uh, uh, James Rosenquist, the, uh, the pop artist, just all sorts of people. And uh, one of the people I'll, I'll read from later is Patrick Smith, who wrote the great historical novel, A Land Remembered. I hope you've all, do you all know what that book is, A Land Remembered? Yeah. Um, uh, the icon feature works a little differently than a typical profile because it's all in their words. So what I'll be doing today is I'll do a very brief introduction of the people, uh, and then I'll just read from their interviews, which um, I interview them, take their, it's sort of an oral history um, situation where I, I take their quotes, arrange them. Uh, I have to cut some because we don't have unlimited space in the magazine, and uh, hopefully tell their stories. And today I picked uh, 
probably too many people. If I'm running too long, just somebody wave at me and I'll, I'll skip to the end. Um, the people uh, who might be of interest to people who care about history, uh, but mainly people from Pinellas County. I want to start with uh, Louise Gopher. Uh, she's a, she was a Seminole tribe elder who devoted her life to educating Native American Floridians. Uh, now she's not from Pinellas, uh, but I like starting history-oriented oriented talks with her uh, because she lived so much history and her family did too. Um, I interviewed her in Glades County uh, on the Brighton Seminole Indian Reservation in 2014. And that was about two years before she died. So here's how it starts. I was born in an orange grove because that's where my parents were working at the time. So that's where they established their camp. I was born in a chicky. Sometimes we would live in a trailer or some other structure. I must have been almost finished with school before I actually moved into a house with all the comforts. Indoor bathrooms, indoor showers, running water. When I was a kid, I only spoke my native language, Creek, no English. I guess my father knew a little bit to get by at work, and my mother probably did too, but I didn't learn English until I started school. I was the first female member of the Seminole tribe to earn a bachelor's degree. I lived in Fort Pierce, and a junior college had been built, Indian River Community College, and I finished two years there, and then went to Florida Atlantic University. <coughs> After a while, people kept saying, she's been going to school forever but I knew the education was helping me. We were so into pushing our kids into the white culture and catching them up that we were forgetting about our own culture. We were trying to fix this for years, trying to teach the Native American language and history to our young people. And the effort became a charter school, which opened on the reservation in 2007. We call it Pemativ Amekhav, which means our way school. The traditional foods are still my favorite foods. I like fry bread and sofki. Sofki is a drink that we drink all the time, anytime. It's made from grains like rice or grits or oatmeal. In the old days, it was made from roasted corn, which was a long procedure. We still make it that way, but not often. So when we do have it, everybody jumps on it. We lived in camps near Fort Pierce with a lot of other families living nearby. My parents did agricultural work. It seemed like every evening there was a big bonfire or campfire and we sat around and that's when you listen to the stories and legends and learn the history. The mascot thing has been a big issue for some teams, but I don't mind FSU's mascot. The outfits are, and everything are correct. There's nothing cartoonish or ugly. I think FSU understands our history. We actually talked about that a lot more too, and she, she had really great things to say about FSU. Uh, we have two dialects in the Seminole tribe. It's like having two languages. One is the Creek language and the other is Miccosukee. I speak Creek. The languages are so different, a lot of people who understand one can't understand the other. My grandfather, DeSoto Tiger, he was killed when my mother was two weeks old. Um, he's a history story. Did you ever hear of the John Ashley gang? They ran up and down the South Florida coast in the 1910s to about the 1920s. They were outlaws. Where my grandfather fits in, he was their first victim. He was a fur trapper and was taking some otter hides down to Miami in 1911. John Ashley killed him and took the hides. Uh, next up is Guff Stavros. Uh, he's a businessman, a philanthropist. Uh, used to be a member of the Florida Bar to, Board of Governors. And he's also the namesake of the uh, Pinellas County School District Stavros Institute, which is home to Enterprise Village and Finance Park. He was 82 when I spoke to him way back in 2007, which would make him about 96 today. My father came to America when he was 14. At the, age of or at the age of nine, his parents sold him to a wealthy man in Athens to be a gardener's helper. One day he was sent out to run some errands 
and he got involved in some other things and he never finished the errands. So he got a pretty bad whipping. He ran away and worked in a factory until he saved enough money to come to America. He came to New York City, went to a Greek restaurant and got a job as a dishwasher. He stayed there until they taught him how to cook. For 50 years, he was a restaurant owner. He owned diners. At the age of 19, I landed at Utah Beach about 50 days after D-Day. We went across three campaigns, northern France, Ardennes, and Rhineland. I was wounded on January 19, 1945. That was the last day that I was able to use my left hand. We moved to Florida, and my parents came down to stay with us to see their grandchildren. My father said to me, son, I know you want to go in the business, so I'll look around for you. This was 1958. After a while, he said the area was ready for a good hamburger, hot dog, milkshake, and soda place. And I told him I didn't go to Columbia University to open up a hot dog stand. But my father was right, and I was wrong. If I listened to him, all these McDonald's you see now would be called Gus's. <laughs> I was one of the three who started Better Business Forms, which is the company that he made most of his money at here in Pinellas County. I eventually bought out the other, the other two men out, so I was the sole owner. We started with three employees and built it to 550. I used my philosophies of business. Take care of your employees and listen to the customer. At Florida State, when they asked me to chair the Education Foundation, I asked people about, about the foundation and they laughed at me. The boosters were the big thing at Florida State, football. So I went up there and I called the deans together, the president, the boosters, everyone. We all met in a room and I said, look, we're all working for the same university. We have to work together. And we ended up raising $302 million. Once we've attained success, then we must prepare to die poor. It sounds strange, but you've got to do that. My wife and I have given the charity 150% of what I got from my company. The only selfish thing I've done because of my love for baseball is I'm a 1% owner of the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. And this is before they changed their name to the Rays. I didn't do it as an investment. To me, it's just the thrill of saying I'm a 1% owner of a professional baseball team. I enjoy it, but I don't sleep well when they lose. Uh, Nicole Stotts, another uh, Pinellas County person. She's a retired astronaut, grew up, grew up here, and I think in Clearwater. Uh, she flew in the space shuttle, I think twice, and is n best known for sending the first live tweet from space in 2009. We spoke in 2020. The difficult thing about becoming an astronaut was convincing myself that I should even apply. Because for her, she didn't even know that she could qualify to be an astronaut, but anyway, it worked out well. Most of our weekends were spent hanging out at the Clearwater Executive Airport, where my dad built and flew small airplanes. It was hugely influ influential on me, even though I didn't really know it at the time. As I got older, I realized I really did like flying. I think when tourists come to Florida, the first stop should be the Kennedy Space Center, and then they can go to the Orlando sites. See the reality first, and then go where you can, get, where you can imagine other things. My dad was killed in a small airplane crash the week before my 16th birthday. I think what it did, it kind of reinforced my desire to understand how things fly. At the time, I felt completely baffled. How can this person who loved to fly and who really flew well, how could that happen? It was devastating, honestly, but it didn't scare me from flying. I think about my mom, and I'm in all of her strength. Her husband is killed in an airplane crash, and then her daughter wants to get a pilot's license and study aeronautical engineering. Looking at Earth from space, you realize that the only border that matters is that thin blue line of Earth's atmosphere. Being in space is having to manage those thoughts of just how incredibly, overwhelmingly beautiful our planet looks, and yet knowing that it's not always that pretty on the surface. 
the conundrum is, okay, how do you take this experience and present it in a way that allows other people to appreciate it like that so that we can really take action to solve the problems on Earth? I will not downplay the adventure of flying in space. I highly recommend it. But in the end, I would not have strapped on to 7 million pounds of exploding rocket thrust with a seven-year-old at home if I didn't think what I was about to do was going to be worthwhile for him and a lot of other people. There's got to be a greater good to it. We're not just working on the space shuttle, we're living there. So we have to have these human things there with us. I brought up a little watercolor set. First you have to get everything organized because if you don't, everything will just float away. I used a drink bag, which has a little straw at the end to squirt out some water. And if you do it slow enough, the water comes out in little balls that float. Then you take the brush, and just before physically touching the ball of water, it's like the water wants to move onto the end of the brush. And then you take this ball of water down to the paint to get the color. And right before getting it there, the water wants to move to the paint and then back to the brush as colored water. Then it was a matter of painting. I wouldn't say it's painting like we do down here, where the brush actually touches the paper, because if it did, all the colored water wanted to get sucked onto the paper at one time. So I discovered that the way to paint was really just kind of, of getting to that point where the ball of water is just touching the paper and then dragging along the paper instead of touching the brush to it. I just really thought that was neat to see how you would paint in space. Spiritual is a good word to use in describing, to des in describing being in space. I was feeling connected to things in a way that I hadn't before. I was experiencing the universe in a new way. I also talked to another astronaut called, named Edgar Mitchell, who was uh, part of the Apollo program. And uh, he talked a lot about that, too, about when he was in space, he felt, actually felt the presence of aliens when he was in space. All right, next up is Tom James. We probably all know um, as the guy that ran Raymond James for so long. He's now retired. I talked to him back in 2013. Back in, back in 74, when times were really tough and it looked like we were gonna go broke, I had a written plan for how to shut the business down over a three month period. When do I stop doing new business and just start delivering the stuff out before I run out of money? I had that plan. Boy, we were close. How do I relax? The answer is I don't. I'm an activities-driven person. I fill up time. If I go on vacation, I have a schedule for every minute. Uh, his father actually founded the company which he took over. My father was one of the world's nicest people. He was a really good person, a moral person of high integrity. He's the, he's the person who influenced me more than anyone else. I started playing in a rock band when I was in high school. I went and saw Elvis Presley when he came to St. Petersburg in the 1950s and got really taken with the music. I got a guitar and taught myself how to play. My art education has been in, in the real world, looking at a lot of art, talking to artists. The more I talk to artists about how they did it, what their methods were, I just developed more and more taste for what I liked. You want to save religiously. It's most important that you develop the habit of putting aside so much money a year out of what you earn. People say 10%, 5%, but you start with whatever you can. It's all about discipline. I decided that I wanted to have a Western and Wildlife Museum. Mary and I wanted it right here in Tampa Bay, in the Tampa Bay area. We wanted it to be in downtown St. Petersburg to help St. Petersburg develop a reputation for being a great destination to see art. It'll complement the Dolly Museum, which I've had the pleasure of supporting for 15, 17 years, and the Chihuly, and all the other museums in the market. When we talked, it was before the museum was even, had been announced yet. Uh, giving back is a philosophy. I believe that it that it's, cons or it's consistent with your obligations and your economic best interest to create an environment that is better. I don't think that 
thinking about shareholders and maximizing profits is inconsistent with pledging part of your profits to charity. Next up is Alex Sink, who used to be Florida's CFO. Um, she also came within 1% of uh, becoming our Florida's governor in 2010, and her husband, Bill McBride, ran for governor in 2002, and he lost to Jeb Bush. I spoke to her in 2017. I come from a famous family, the Siamese twin family. My great-grandfather, Chang Bunker, was one of the twins. He had 10 children, three boys and seven girls, and my grandfather was the youngest son. I grew up in a house that Chang Bunker built. My father still lives there. Everybody should make a goal to get one of those back roads of Florida books and go exploring. When you drive somewhere, take a different road, a different route, explore. This is such a phenomenal state. Bill and I met within months of me moving to Florida in January of 1984. I met him at a business lunch and we had our first date in May. I was living in Miami and he was in Tampa. We just had so many things in common, so many common interests. We eventually got married and I moved over to Tampa and we had two babies right away. I grew up in a tobacco farm in, small, in a small North Carolina town that in itself has become iconic. I grew up in Mount Airy, also known as Mayberry. The Siamese twins were really sharp businessmen, and my grandfather was an incredible businessman, an amazing businessman, and my own father is an amazing businessman to this day. Everybody, of course, when you're a candidate, everybody has their own idea of what you should say, what you should look like, what clothes you should wear, how your hair should be, I'll never forget one time this guy came up to me and he said, when you're speaking, you squint. You should open your eyes. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I can't. These, are, these eyes are inherited. <laughs> the year I lost to Rick Scott, I lost by one percentage point. It was the closest gubernatorial election in Florida history. Every other Democrat that year, because of the Tea Party, lost by 10 points. But it didn't matter. I didn't win. I had all these dreams and hopes and visions for the future, and I didn't, I didn't get to do it. It was depressing. We had our hopes and dreams dashed. My favorite book of all time is A Land Remembered by Patrick Smith. I just sent a copy to a newcomer to Tampa, and I said, okay, first thing you have to do is you've got to read this book. It gives you such a flavor for the history of Florida. Surveys show that a woman has to be asked seven times before she'll agree to run for office. You ask a guy to run for office and it's like, oh yeah, where do I sign up? We need more women in public life. We need more women in business. We found Bill, her husband, dead from a heart attack in 2012. It was totally unexpected. I don't like being a widow. Building a new life is not easy. You wake up every morning and force yourself to get out of bed and put both feet on the ground and keep moving. It's like you've cut off your arm. You look around and say, where's my arm? It's not there anymore. George Billeris uh, grew up in, in Tarpon Springs and saw a lot of history too. Uh, he, he was a sponge diver and uh, when he got a little bit older and couldn't, couldn't uh, die for sponges anymore, he became kind of a, a sponge entrepreneur and did very well. Uh, we spoke in 2016, just about eight months before he died. My, my mother was big on education, but I'd go sponging every summer. At 14 years old, I was making as much money as the local bank president. Not only me, but all the divers. In the winter, I go to school. The reason I'm in Tarpon Springs is because my grandfather was invited to help develop the sponge industry here. Greece had a sponge industry, and the only other country in the world that had sponge divers. It was right around 1900. They found an abundance of sponge right here, and immediately the migration started. The industry went from nothing, no boats, to 180 boats 
and Tarpon Springs became the sponge capital of the world. We used to lose eight to 10 men a year. When I was growing up, it wasn't odd to go downtown and see 40 or 50 divers crippled from the bends. I remember going to school and playing football. And I remember the guy in the PA system. We were playing Clearwater High School and he named all the players. And when he got to Tarpon Springs, we were all Greek, or at least 95 to 99 percent of us, and so he could barely pronounce our names. But we had a quarterback out of Palm Harbor, and his name was Smith. The announcer was like, oh my God, we have a Smith, a name we could finally pronounce. The people who came here from Greece came here without money, without knowing the language, without anything, and yet today, they developed a great industry <coughs> and made us what we are today. I never wanted to do anything else but work in sponges. I worked at the A&P meat market for a while, but I didn't like it. <coughs> I plan to go out this summer for the last time and make one more dive. I'll probably work anywhere from 30 to 40 feet deep, west-northwest of here. It used to be my favorite spot, the place where I got started. I don't know if he ever got a chance to do that because he died soon after. Uh, Ray Arsenault, who's a historian, uh, recently retired from USF as a professor there. He taught history for many years. And he wrote uh, some pretty important books. He wrote uh, Freedom Riders, uh, 1961 and the Struggle for Racial Justice, which was a really big book. And uh, most re recently, he wrote a book about Arthur Ashe. As you can see, he's got a really cluttered office. We, we spoke there in 2017. We lived in Pensacola in 1957, just after the Montgomery bus boycotts. And when my grandmother would take me into town, she'd always insist that we sit in the back of the bus. I can remember all the whites in the front looking at us. Obviously, I was young, about eight or nine, and I really couldn't fully comprehend what was going on. Later, I was very proud of my grandmother for doing that. Histori historians, we say, are slow journalists. We're journalists who can't deal with deadlines. Florida has a very heavy frontier heritage. It was underpopulated for so long. It didn't have much in the way of legal culture. Almost everybody was from somewhere else. Even today, only about 35% of Floridians were born here. The average state is 64%. So Florida has become a place to reinvent yourself, kind of a last chance if you failed somewhere else. Florida attracts people who take risks, which I think widens the state's spectrum of potential behavior. From the age of 11, I knew what I wanted to be. If I wasn't gonna be in the NBA, then I wanted to be a historian. I love the Highwaymen painters. It's such a great Florida story, these sort of self-trained artists selling these paintings out on the road for $5, $10. Most of those paintings are worth a couple thousand dollars now. I've often said to my students, just to get them riled up, that we have to figure out a way to get seven, eight, nine million Floridians to leave because the ecosystem can't just bear all these people. <clears throat> You're only as good as your legal justice system. If you use the legal justice system to be the enforcer of Jim Crow and inequality, then bad, bad things are gonna happen. We need good judges and good policemen. Many of the students that I've had over the years have gone on to be teachers. I think half of the history teachers in Pinellas County were my former students. I'm very proud of that. Sunday mornings, I play tennis on the old clay courts at Bartlett Park in St. Petersburg. That's where Chrissy Everett won her first state juniors title. Arthur Ashe played there in 1969. I was a good basketball player, but I'm not a very good tennis player, but I love playing tennis. It's a game you can play your whole life. I feel so privileged and fortunate first of all, to be a university prof teacher. It's just the greatest job in the world. It keeps you young. I love the kids. It's never boring. 
History is the only thing that never runs out. You wake up, there's 24 hours of history to deal with. The Freedom Writers book changed my life. It succeeded beyond it, anything I could ever have imagined. I worked eight or nine years on it. The book kind of rediscovered the Freedom Writers, and it was so satisfying because they are all but forgotten. Histor historians didn't put much stock in the Freedom Writers as a, as a milestone. But I think I convinced everybody that the riots were a huge turning point in terms of the beginning of the 60s and direct action and ordinary people doing extraordinary things. John Lewis, one of the Freedom Riders, became a close friend, along with many of the other Freedom Riders. We were on Oprah together and went on tours through the Deep South. I just feel lucky to have known them. A little bit of baseball history here. Uh, Don Zimmer calls himself a baseball lifer, and it's true that he witnessed a lot of baseball history during his career. And he lived pretty close to this, where we're at right now. He lived in Seminole. We spoke in uh, 2010 when he was 79 and still coaching for the Rays. He died in 2014. Starting out, I made $140 a month, but I thought I was a millionaire. Getting played to play, base, to be, to play baseball, that was something special. I never squawked about my salary. I would say that's, that's part of why I'm still in the game after 62 years. I got hit in the head in 1953 playing in the minor leagues. I had a skull fracture and was in the hospital 31 days. He was a big redheaded pitcher. He wasn't throwing at me, he was just wild. We get a Christmas card from his family every year. In 1956, I'm up with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Game of the week, Saturday afternoon, and I get hit and it shatters my cheekbone. And I've got almost like a detached retina. Al, Cam Al Campanis always said that he thought I would have been one hell of a baseball player if not for getting hit. I'm the reason for helmets. When I was in the hospital, they made it compulsory for the National League to wear helmets. It took them about a year to make it compulsory in the American League. Jackie Robinson treated me great. I wasn't a great player, but I think what he respected about me is, is if I had to go through a wall to catch, a, catch the ball, or if I had to die for a ball, I would. That's the way I played, and he respected that. We became very good friends. Jackie would call me for a golf game. That was a thrill. Jackie Robinson asking Don Zimmer to play golf with him. Branch Rickey had, a had, a, had to be a brilliant man to pick the one man in the world to become the first black major leaguer. Branch Rickey never cursed, never used a bad word, but they say when he called Jackie from Montreal, called him up from Montreal, the AAA club, when he called him to Brooklyn, he told him, and then he went on and said all these horrible things to him. He just wanted to see how Jackie reacted. That's what Jackie was going to hear out in the world, and he passed the test. Jackie was a tough son of a gun. I don't say much about this, but I'm sitting there in the dugout next to Billy Martin, and there was a rule at that time, so many inches up, that's as far as the pine tar can go. George Brett comes up with a bat, and I see black all the way up to the label, and he hits that home run, and I said to Billy, I guarantee you that bat is illegal by the rules, and Billy started out. I can still see it, George Brett charging that umpire. I'm not proud of it, but it was a rule. For 25 years, George Steinbrenner was my friend, a good friend, but we haven't spoken since I quit the Yankees. I don't regret leaving, but I regret the way it worked out with George. Bubby, Bave Bubby Bavese, when I got hit in the head, he said, go to Florida and recuperate. And then he gave me money to come down here, and we never left. Florida is now my home. One day, somebody was doing a, a story and was talking to Pee Wee Reese, 
And he said, boy, that Zimmer has a lot of guts. Hit in the head once, broken cheekbone. So Pee Wee says, I don't know if he has a lot of guts or if he's just dumb. <laughs> I don't know anything else but baseball, and I don't have to know anything else. Baseball was my life, and after 62 years, I'm still here. Staying in the uh, athlete, or athlete arena, um, I talked to Winky Wright a few years ago, and he, usually I, I try to interview people in person in their office or their home, but Winky Wright wanted to be interviewed at uh, the Kissing Cousins restaurant in St. Pete. So that was a pretty chaotic interview, but it turned out fine. Being a businessman, hands down, is harder than being a boxer. My best, my best experiences in life have been doing stuff with my kids and family. Don't get me wrong, I partied a lot, partied with the best people. That's cool, but the best times were with my family, going to Disney World with my kids, going skating with my kids. That's the kind of stuff you remember. Even as a kid, I wasn't scared of getting hit. I was so quick that I felt you couldn't hit me. For real. My biggest thing was learning how to box and gain more power so I could hurt people and knock them out. Once I did that, my boxing took off. My grandparents moved me from D.C. to St. Pete when I was 15 going on 16. At first, I didn't want to be here. You have to remember that I was moving from a big city, <coughs> but now I feel blessed to be here. Within a year, St. Pete felt like home. Sometimes you get drunk people who want to fight you. I don't play like that. I get paid to fight. I get paid to throw punches. I don't want to have to hit anybody with my bare hands. You know what I'm saying? That's going to be a problem. And what he meant by that is he would probably have killed somebody had they really succeeded in fighting him. My grandmother gave me the Winky nickname. I was probably a year old, I guess, and I used to wink at people. The world is changing. There are a lot of people who don't want that change to happen. People who want to keep a certain demographic of people down. When you're boxing, you're amped up, hyped up. You've got the adrenaline, adrenaline flowing. So you really don't feel it when you get hit until later. The next day, that's when you feel the pain. Next up is uh, Gene Patterson. Uh, he's a journalist. He was the uh, publisher of the St. Pete Times, now the Tampa Bay Times, for many years. And he also was the editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution back in the days of the, the Civil Rights era, when it was in, in full swing. When I was a boy, I learned the value of land. My father was a small town bank cashier, and of course, with the depression, the bank closed its doors. My mother had a small farm that she bought with money her father had left her, and that became our life raft. <coughs> when you have a piece of land, you can eat. Newspapers are having a difficult time because the electronic media have taken away their advertising, particularly classified advertising. And that's 40% of the revenue of a lot of newspapers. And when you lose 40% of your revenue, what do you do? We're in the process of creating an entirely new economic model for newspapers. <coughs> there's no silver bullet. There's no movement some publisher is going to yell, or, or there's, no, there's no moment some publisher is going to yell Eureka, and you've got it. It's a matter of 100 little loose ends that are being explored and pulled together. Newspapers have something none of the other media have. We have the ability to report and gather news. The written word and carefully reported news must exist or democracy can't exist. Nelson Pointer, who owned the St. Petersburg Times, used to say, if you own 80 newspapers, which community of those 80 do you love the most? The answer is you don't love any of them. You just love the bottom line. He felt a newspaper was a sacred trust that owed its, owed its community its undivided attention. 
I was the editor of the Atlanta Journal Constitution during the 1960s, and I wrote a column with my name on it and my picture on it every day, seven days a week. You had to address the issues of race relations because the civil rights marchers were in the streets. The sit-ins were going on, the riots, the fire hoses, the police dogs, the killings. This had to be addressed, and not simply by reporting it, but by editors who would stand up and say what we had been doing was wrong and we had to change. This had a great effect, not because people immediately said, oh, that editor is right, I'm going to change my mind. That didn't happen. But they began talking to each other, and the frozen silence that had covered this issue all these years was broken. Even if only to cuss the editors they disagreed with, people began talking. And once you get a community in conversation with itself, you're going to get good decisions. I'd get threats. I'd get nasty telephone calls. The hard part was when they'd call my home and talk to my wife or daughter in the most profane, profane ways. The mayor of Atlanta in the 1950s, a wonderful old man named Bill Hartsfield, called me when I first became editor of the Constitution. He asked if I was getting any anonymous phone calls. I said yes, a whole lot. <clears throat> he said he spent years getting anonymous phone calls and he told me to ignore them. He said anybody who won't tell you his name is a coward and he's not going to do anything to hurt you. He said the only fellow you have to worry about is the one who never calls. When my daughter was nine, somebody shot her dog down behind our house. I don't know who it was. She called me at the office. She said, come home. She was crying. I came home and the dog was bleeding. I kept telling my daughter, look, we don't know who shot her. But my daughter said she knew that it was somebody who didn't like what you've been writing in the paper. That little girl was taking a beating in school. People would learn her father was the editor of the Constitution and she was constantly coming home saying that they had called her terrible words. I tried to explain to her, but it was tough for a child. The meanness of those people was beyond belief. I never kept a gun in my office at the Constitution, but I had some visitors who became so threatening at times that I worried whether one of them, one of them may have one. So I put a ball-peen hammer in the right lower drawer of my desk. <clears throat> I cracked that drawer open a couple times, but never had to take it out. Martin Luther King lived in Atlanta when I was there. I got to know him well, well enough that we would exchange notes. I disagreed with him when he started committing his SCLC against the war on Viet in Vietnam. Regardless of whether the war was right or wrong, a good idea or a bad one, it seemed to me to entangle the American civil rights struggle with a foreign policy disagreement was costly to the civil rights movement, and I said so editorially. By the time he was assassinated in 1968, Martin Luther King had lost his headway. The Black Panthers, the Black Power people, the militant activist wing of the civil rights movement had pretty much discredited his nonviolent approach. I felt he was right, though, and they were wrong. It's hard to believe we came from such times, but it was hard for me to believe that my grandfather marched off the Confederate Army and he and four of his brothers came home in coffins. In my time, in the 1960s, I was not in a, con I was not in a Confederate uniform. As a matter of fact, I was regarded as a Southern turncoat by many of my critics, but I don't think I was. I thought I was leading us in the direction of the that the South had to go which was towards justice. The extremely low wages of Americans and the extremely high tax benefits for the rich were two of the factors that led to the Great Depression. Maybe we're not anywhere close to that now, but it's something we have to watch. Next up is one of those highway, highwaymen painters. It was uh, Mary Ann Carroll. She was the only female of the highwaymen painters. I interviewed her in 2007 at her home in Fort Pierce. Let me just check. I think we still have good time. 
<clears throat> Here's a little bit from Marianne Carroll. I met Harold Newton by the road in Fort Pierce. He was one of the first highwaymen. It was his car that attracted my eye. There were flames painted on it. He did that for attention. He told me what he did, and he showed me his paintings in the back seat. I watched him paint. He wasn't my teacher. He wasn't my teacher, though. He showed me how to mix oils, but when I was a child, I could already draw anything I saw. Then I started going in the row with the guys. I was probably 18 when I sold my first painting. When I was young, the options I had were cleaning house, babysitting, picking fruit, nurse's aid. Basically, that was it for a woman in Fort Pierce. But I wanted to be a painter, and there were things I had to do to support my art. I never picked fruit. I did some babysitting, and I did some house cleaning. I worked, the, I worked in a gladiola, gladiola field when I was younger, cutting the flowers with a pocket knife. My husband left me and the kids when the youngest was five. So I had seven children to raise, and I had to have money. They had to eat, and they had to have a place to sleep. I raised seven kids as a single parent. A lot of the times I went on the road, I would take the kids with me. If I went, if I went on the road when they were in school, I made sure I got back before school got out. I never worried about my safety. I used to be thin, and I could jump high, high as a house. I was strong. I was so happy then. I wasn't afraid to walk anywhere. I wasn't afraid of breaking down along the side of the road. I'd have a gun, maybe a 22 or a 38 in the car, but only for my protection. I didn't really feel like I could find a person who I couldn't take, who I couldn't take care of as long as they would fight fair. I would do at least two 24 by 36 paintings a day. It was, a, it was hard work straight through. An 18 by 24 would sell for $18, a 24 by 36 for 35, a 12 by 24 was 12.50. People commission me now, and the price depends on what they want me to do. These landscapes are true Florida scenes, and a lot of these things I paint, you don't see anymore. Treasures are being, are, are being destroyed. That's why I like painting landscapes. It's painting history. I have peace of mind when I paint. I'm content. My mind pictures what I paint, and I go to those places in my mind. I want to paint a masterpiece, but I don't know what it would be. People say my trees, the poinciannas, Poinciana, the are what I do best. But I say wherever I can feel what I'm painting, like I'm there, those are the best ones. It actually kind of breaks my heart to think about the things that aren't here anymore. I look across the street from my house, and I see houses where I, I used to see trees. What I'm going to do, by the grace of God, sometime soon, I'm going to paint that scene but I'm going to take all those houses out and I'm going to bring back the trees. Let's change the, change the pace to H. Lee Moffat, who was best known for being the namesake of the Moffat Cancer Center. But before that, he was an attorney and a speaker of the Florida House. Uh, he grew up in Tampa and went to USF, and we spoke in 2014 when he was 72. You show me a good politician, a good public servant, a, a good public servant, I should say, and I'll show you a person who has first and foremost good people skills. The ones who excel are the ones who are not afraid to strike out on their own and innovate, rather than being herded along by some sort of party policy or party politics or dogma. I like the ones who can think for themselves. Nothing has ever come easy for me. It was not easy to graduate from college. I was working full time. The same was true in law school. The key, at least, to any success that I ever had, particularly with the Cancer Center and, its pol and in politics, is perseverance. The amount of politics in medicine is always amazing to me. It's all about turf. It's about ego. It's about money. It's, it's really sad that there was so much infighting. In fact, there was more infighting in the politics of medicine than there is in Tallahassee. Playing baseball during high school, I crunched my knee sliding into second base, and it was always a problem. 
And then later in life, when I was 29 years old, I found out that same knee. I'd always thought I hurt it because of the baseball injury, but I had a tumor there. It turned out to be malignant, and I had to have the tumor removed. My father was a welder. He tried for years to teach me how to weld, but I was just all thumbs. Jokingly, one day he said, well, you're never going to amount to a damn thing. You can't work with your hands, so you may as well be a lawyer. <laughs> when you're in elected office, too many people think, think it's about them. The real reason people should be in public service is to serve the people. We're a diverse state. When you look at North Florida compared to Miami, it's very difficult to find a, to find a consensus in a state that is so diverse. When I first floated the idea of building a cancer center, I thought I, would re I thought I would receive support. I was absolutely amazed at the amount of opposition. The local med medical associations, the local hospitals, even from areas around the state that were 100 miles away, did not support it and actively fought it. And when I finally got some money in the budget, just the plan for the creation of the cancer center, the state medical schools went to the governor, and the governor, who was Bob Graham at that time, got him to veto the first money for the cancer center. The governor had not been persuaded that a career or that a cancer center was a good idea. So I had to turn to some of my friends on the appropriations committee to carefully consider the governor's budget. And they saw fit to cut the governor's budget by about a third in the running of the office of the governor. It was amazing. It was so much easier to get the governor's attention for the creation of the cancer center. <laughs> I gave him his money back to run his office in exchange for his pledge that he would support the cancer center. Sometimes in politics, it takes a meat ax to get things done. I didn't want the cancer center to be named after me. I didn't want people to think I was fighting for the cancer center to create a monument for myself. I fought for it because I saw the death of my friends and I saw the state of Florida had either the first or second highest incidence of death from cancer in the United States. But my legislative colleagues tried to name it after me when I was presiding one day. Actually, the next to the last day, I believe, before I retired. They offered an amendment to another bill. I was presiding in the chair at the time, and I ruled the amendment out of order. I brought the delegation up and told them, thank you very much, but I don't want you to do that. And they all nodded and walked away. I thought the matter had been taken care of. Well, unbeknown to me, the next day I was called to the governor's office to put together the finishing touches on that particular legislative session. The governor said he wanted to talk to me about some budget issues. Little did I know it was a plan to get me out of the chair so they could take the amendment up and to name it after me without me knowing, which they did. The bill was walked down to the Senate. The Senate immediately passed it and I didn't even know that it happened until I read about it in the, next day, the next day in the newspaper. I was outfoxed. All right. Patrick Smith, the last one. Thanks so much for listening so long to all these. Um, so many people that I interviewed mention Patrick Smith. A lot mention Carl Hyacin too, but a lot mention Patrick Smith as well. And uh, it was really a great interview because I interviewed him in the summer when my children were pretty young and they came with me because they were out of school and it was, it was fun. His wife was really nice to my kids and it was a, it was a fun interview even though he was at the en very end of his life and when I interviewed him, he was in a hospital bed that I had set up in his living room. Very gracious person though. Um, here's how that one starts. Marjorie Kenan Rawlings. I wrote my master's thesis in college on her. She was a tremendous writer, but her novels usually covered one year and that's it. I wrote A Land Remembered because I wanted to try to picture life here in Florida over a long period of time. And I don't think anyone else had attempted a novel that covered more than 100 years of Florida history. If I could get out of this bed, I'd like to write a novel about the Indian River Lagoon. It's a waterway that they say is dying. If it really would actually die, 
it would affect not just the wildlife, not just the fish, but everyone. I met James Meredith a long time ago. I was working for the University of Mississippi in public relations, and he was the first black student. I escorted him to class for the, for the two or three weeks until things settled down. It was an unusual time, I'll say that. My main duty was just to keep the reporters from following him, trying to interview him, or go into the classroom. There were a lot of unpleasant things that happened, and I just prefer not to dwell on it or even try to remember it. To me, accuracy is the most important part of writing. A lot of writers, accuracy doesn't bother them that much. If they make a big mistake, they just say, oh, this is fiction. But I always try to write accurately and create a picture of life as it really is and people and things as they really are. I went down through the big cypress swamp one time and saw all these little chicky huts. It's very unusual to see people living that way. I had an idea I wanted to write something set down there close to the Everglades. So I was just looking around. That turned into my novel, Forever Island, which is one of his unknown books, really. But it's good, too. One of the things that young people who have read A Land Remembered question me about, they always ask, why does everybody have to die? They don't ever want anyone to die. But people do die, especially in Pioneer, Florida. Buddy Epson was a big fan of A Land Remembered. We talked by telephone about it several times, and then one day he just flew here from California, landed in Orlando, rented a car, and drove over to my house. He wanted to talk about everything in it. I guess he was going to probably make a movie um, using it. My wife Iris took a picture of him, but she cut off the top of his head. <laughs> he was pretty tall. Researching the book, I had to read about a dozen books, I guess, about specific things that happened in Florida, like that great freeze of 1895. You just can't dream that up, you know. I had a lot of old timers, old pioneer people tell me stories. I'd sit down and talk to them. They'd tell me about living through those swarms of mosquitoes and alligators and all kinds of things. A Land Remembered is not based on a, real f on a real family. It's based on a dozen real families. It's funny, another thing, when, when I talk to old Florida families, a lot of them think the book is written about their family. An article in the Miami Herald got me interested in migrant workers. They had arrested one of those independent contractors for enslaving people, and no one would testify against them in court. When I was researching, researching Angel City, the novel I wrote about a migrant family, I went down to Homestead and posed as a migrant and lived in the camps. I picked tomatoes and squash and all that stuff. I had to know what it was like. Death doesn't scare me. I have emphysema. I broke a bunch of my bones, and before that, I had cancer. I also had a really bad stroke. I've been hit so hard by what's got me in this bed that I'm not afraid of dying anymore. That's it. <laughs> um, th thanks so much for listening. Mm -hmm.